visiting with Professor Kimura, uh, I think four years ago. Um, it was wonderful to sort of refresh my memory and what a great place this is. Um, it's also really an honor. Um, I'm very, very much flattered to be asked to, to speak here. Um, I've never actually worked uh, directly with like a hard sensei, but um, from, from way back, I, I've been an admirer of his work, um, friction and, and liquids. Um, I especially remember when I was just finishing a postdoc um, reading papers um, with uh, Professor Ibuki on um, dielectric friction and translational motion of ions. And, um, I just thought were the, the best thing out. Um, and our paths have been pretty parallel. We, we both looked a lot at supercritical fluids, um, rotational, translational friction. Uh, it's kind of surprising, I guess, that we've never worked together. But anyway, um, again, I'm honored to be here. What I'm going to talk about today is, um, I'd like to give an overview of where I think um, our understanding of solvation and ionic liquids um, lies. And I'm not assuming that people are experts in ionic liquids, although, unfortunately, I'm sure that maybe half the audience is. But I'll give a little bit of an introduction. Um, and then just some perspectives that I've gained throughout the last sort of five years that we've been working on the problem. Uh, so first of all, just I won't spend a lot of time. What are added liquids, or what are room temperature added liquids? Um, they're not really fundamentally different from inorganic molten salts. Uh, lithium chloride melts at something like 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, the main difference between what we call ionic liquids these days and molten salts is just we've brought the temperature down so that they're liquid at room temperature or at least below 100 degrees. Um, we do that by increasing the size of the ions, increasing their asymmetry and their inability to pack well in the crystals. Um, and one can get melting points well below room temperature. Uh, these are the typical players, and I will talk a lot about ionic liquids and not identify specific liquids I'm talking about, but uh, many of the things uh, we've done and other people have done have used this imidazolium cation, uh, where typically one R group is a, is a methyl group and the other one is some number of carbon, uh, an alkane chain of typically four, six, eight carbon atoms. These cation families are paired with anions, and particularly these fluorinated things are, are very useful because they tend to be the things that give the lowest viscosities and um, lowest melting points. So anyway, these are what room temperature ionic liquids are. They're neat um, ionic systems. And not only in Japan, but basically everywhere I know of, there's a lot of excitement about ionic liquids. And I'm not going to go over much of this other than to say that in the last uh, nine years, uh, research has really exploded in, into um, studies of ionic liquids, and in some sense, uh, 92 was a, sort of a, a watershed year when um, the first water and air stable ionic liquids were developed, or the first class of them. Um, and since then, especially the last decade, people have done an enormous amount of work trying to say, what are these things good for? Um, here are some of the properties that most people will, will know about. Um, one thing I guess I want to focus on is one can vary cations and anions by adding uh, functional groups, by adding different lengths of the alkyl chains. And it's not at all hard to imagine that one could create a million different ionic liquids. And the idea is that one can, in principle at least, tune these, tune these solvents, if my focus is on solvents, but tune these materials to give lots and lots of different properties. And so, I'm sure you can't read this, but these are the different areas that uh, Ken Seddon uh, highlighted in a recent review of, of where things, where these liquids are being used. Um, this one of the more, I guess, strange ones I'll mention. Um, they're even, they've even been tested as embalming fluids. Um, they uh, often have antibacterial action and um, they preserve tissue and don't have a lot of the nasty properties of current embalming fluids. All right. What I'm going to talk about um, is not how to use them per se, but just how to understand um, 
how chemistry might be different if you use an ionic liquid for a solvent versus conventional solvents. That's really our interest is in solvation. Um, so first of all, what is different about ionic liquids? I guess the most obvious thing is that they're made of ions. Um, and here's a, a simulation that we've done very recently just as a sort of something to help us think about the problem. So this is a, a real ionic liquid. This is a butylmethylmidazole and um, hexafluorophosphate. We've been using the stripped down model of it just to, to reduce the computational um, burden. But anyway, you can think of this as a generic ionic liquid. This is a snapshot of a simulation box. Um, and I won't talk much about these simulations, but just ask, OK, so this is the ionic liquid. What's different between this and a conventional liquid, or in this case, a liquid mixture? If I turn the charges off the cation anion, what happens? Um, well, first of all, um, the cohesive energy, that is, the energy it takes to volatilize this thing completely into separated species, um, is vastly greater in an ionic liquid. The ionic forces um, are typically on the order of 8 to 10 times stronger than the Van der Waals, the, the regular dispersion forces in, in these systems. So if I turn it off, um, the cohesive energy of the system goes down quite a bit. Um, if I allow the system, if I run a constant pressure simulation and I allow the system to expand, um, the difference is about 25%. So that's a very sizable change in volume for a, a dense system. Um, they really are um, more densely packed than, than a typical organic solvent. Um, along with the dense packing, uh, ionic liquids are much less compressible than typical liquids. And if you, again, do this, um, the compressibility goes up by at least a factor of two uh, between an ionic liquid and the equivalent um, uncharged system. So those are all static properties. One of the most important things from my point of view is that ionic liquids are fairly viscous. They're not very fluid, and that's one of their drawbacks if you want to use them for practical purposes, or it can be a drawback. Um, if you take the charges off an ionic liquid, keep all the other things the same, and keep the same volume, uh, you find that the fluidity or one over the viscosity increases quite dramatically. On average, ionic liquids are about 100 times more viscous than conventional organic solvents. All right, so these are some of the differences in this sort of a schematic way between a conventional liquid and an ionic liquid. Um, what does any of this matter? Well, I guess the other thing that I've, I've neglected to say is if you look at these two snapshots, um, there's another difference between the two liquids. And that has to do with how the color is um, dispersed here versus here. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, in this conventional liquid mixture where there aren't charges, there's no particular penalty for two green things being together. Whereas over here, two green things have a negative charge, and they really don't want to be together. There's quite a lot of charge work that goes on in, the, in an ionic liquid. Um, and this is just a, some radial distribution functions um, showing this charge order. Uh, I don't think it's, it's important to go into any of the details here, but uh, say the red curve, I have a central, this is an anion in the ionic liquid. Uh, if I go out from this central anion, I hit rings of cations, anions, cations, uh, anions. And that's the strongly oscillatory behavior. Now, the, these peaks aren't tremendously high, but the order persists for quite a long way. That's different than most conventional liquids. Um, more importantly, though, uh, this ordering belies a, a very delicate balance of charges. So here's a, some other slightly different calculations. If I replace this by a, an uncharged solute and just ask, what is the electrical potential at the site of that solute? It should be approximately zero, and it is. Again, these are simulation numbers, but on average, the potential is almost zero. It's not zero because the cations and the anions are different size and shape, so there's a little bias. Um, if I ask how that essentially neutral electrical potential comes about, 
it comes about by a really delicate balance of very large interactions with the cations in the system. So for this particular box of 343 ion pairs, um, the cations, these are atomic units, give a value of 10 for the, for the potential at this neutral point. The anions give also a value of now minus 10. And the difference is essentially zero. So there's um, quite a large difference between the actual interactions going on and what the potential is due to those net interactions. Uh, moreover, if you look at the fluctuations in this value, they're quite small. So one can say that the, there is a balance of electrical interactions that's quite, quite impressive. Um, there's something like a 10 to the fourth difference between the sizes of what individual ions plus and minus give you at the site of this solute and what the, the actual fluctuations around that value are. So there's a very, very tight coupling is, is all I'm trying to say between, um, between charges. And that's different. Um, there are similar effects in polar liquids, but it's much more um, severe here. So what does that do? Um, how do typical solutes um, when you put them in this environment, how do they, how do they see things? So first, um, talking about solvation energetics, uh, it turns out that solvation energetics aren't very remarkable in you know, uh, Because we like spectroscopy, we've done a lot of work looking at solvent chromism, taking probe molecules that are sensitive to solvent polarity and looking at their spectra in ionic liquids and comparing them with conventional solvents. We're certainly not the first to do this. Many, many people have done this many, many times. And the answers that people have gotten are all about the same. Um, so here's data for one of my favorite molecules, Coomer 153, absorption spectra, emission spectra. Um, the solid curves are conventional solvents. This is an alkane to methylbutane, and this is DMSO. Um, nice shift in the spectrum because it's a, it's a good probe of solvation. Um, the key point is that if you place an ionic liquid uh, on this plot, you find that it falls toward the most polar end of the spectrum of conventional solvents. But the spectrum is not at all uh, remarkable. It's not much more polar than a conventional um, polar liquid. The shape of the spectrum is in no way different. The same holds for emission. So the spectra are not remarkable. If you, if you look at these spectra in more detail, um, we've, we've looked at 21 assorted ionic liquids with this probe. Um, we find that in all cases, the polarity is rather like the most highly polar solvents that you can get. Um, people have measured dielectric constants for ionic liquids. Uh, those don't really gauge the polarity. A better measure for how a molecule like this shifts uh, is the density of charge or the concentration of charge in the liquid. But anyway, um, nothing that remarkable. I want to show you two pieces of, um, two sets of data that are not our work, um, but something very similar to this Coumarin uh, case is electron transfer energies. These are simulation studies by Lyndon Bell. Kelly uh, Kim has also done something quite similar. But what, uh, what Ruth Lyndon Bell did was to look at a sequence of small atomic charges, um, small ions in an ionic liquid. This is the ionic liquid. The identity is important. And saw what energies were involved in adding or subtracting an electron to the, um, to the system. And she did a range of, of initial charges going from minus 3 to plus 3 electrons. Um, an interesting point is when she contrasted the behavior for the reorganization energy of this process or, um, or and for the activation energy for this, these electron transfers, she found a rem remarkable similarity between the ionic liquid and the pseudonitrile, every theorist's first dipolar liquid. Um, so the magnitudes of the reorganization energy are pretty similar. Um, and that's sort of equivalent to what we've seen spectroscopically. But what's really remarkable is um, this pattern of um, this deviation from all being the same number, which signals deviation from simple linear response behavior, um, is very similar in the two systems. And yet, um, 
you know, this is a very small molecule. This is a pair of relatively large species. Um, they're very, very different. Similarly for the activation for energy. So anyway, I found that very, very remarkable. What I find even more remarkable is some experimental work. Um, the solvetochromism I talked about, and these energies have to do with, you've already got a solute, and you play with its charge distribution and ask about energies. A more severe comparison is what if you take a molecule from the gas phase and stick it in solution. So not only are you asking about the attractive interactions, you're also asking about the energy it takes to make a hole in the liquid to put the, put the molecule in. So these are solvation-free energies. Um, experimental data, again, making a very similar comparison. Now, this is an aminazolium with a hexyl and a methyl group instead of methyl-methyl. And this is a different, somewhat fancier anion. But these are uh, what are essentially solvation-free energies in the ionic liquid versus in acetonitrile. Uh, and this is the experimental work was not by Abraham and Creed. They did some um, correlating work. But anyway, the remarkable thing is for solutes that range in size from CO2, um, N-hexane, diethyl ether, THF, paraxylene, cyclohexanol, um, there is an incredibly strong correlation uh, between solvation energy in acetonitrile and solvation energy in the ionic liquid. Again, I find this very remarkable. The line is not exactly one to one. Uh, the slope is one to one, but there is an offset of a small amount. But it's almost identical solvation in all of these varied solutes. So, what to make of it? I don't know. Um, to me, it's very interesting, but it says that. Um, in general, what we've seen is solvation energies are not that distinctive compared to highly polar solvents like acetonitrile. Um, so that's, I guess, unfortunate. But dynamics, there are some pretty distinctive differences. Um, we've spent a lot of time, too much time probably, looking at what we call solvation dynamics. Uh, and that's sort of solve atochromism in a time-dependent way. So these are cartoons based on dipolar liquids because I know how they draw them. Um, and we've done a lot of work with dipolar liquids. So the, the game is that you take a molecule that has a no dipole or a small one in the ground state. When you excite it electronically from the first, from the ground state to the first excited state, something about the solute changes so that its interactions with the solvent change a lot. So here, I create a large dipole. Uh, when I do that instantaneously, um, there is not much of a change. The absorption is essentially instantaneous with respect to the nuclear motions of the solvent. So I create a non-equilibrium state. That non-equilibrium state relaxes. And the emission coming out of the molecule in time, from very early times when I first excite it, to long times when I see essentially a steady state emission, if I can look at the emission in time, I trace out essentially how the solvation energy relaxes as a function of time. So this experiment I call, um, well, people call it dynamic stoke shift. What I'm measuring is what I call the solvation response. Just how long does it take a solvent to change its, its polarization due to a change in the solute charge distribution? We've done this a lot in conventional solvents. So here's a range of conventional solvents. And the dynamics is very fast in conventional solvents, typically. So acetonitrile, the average relaxation time, or the one of read time, is something like 100 femtoseconds. Um, only in special cases do you get to much more than a few, a few picoseconds. In simple non-associated liquids, um, the, the, the times are all just a few picoseconds. Um, in an ionic solvent, Whereas in a dipolar liquid, the dominant dynamics that happens is a reorientation of solvent molecules to polarize. Um, what we expect in ionic liquids is that the dominant change will be a translation of solvent molecules. So here, um, I have sort of a, uh, an e e equal charge distribution around my solute. And here, I put more anions toward the positive end and more cations toward the negative end. Um, because this tracks in a crude way of viscosity, I expect ionic liquids to be slower in general than conventional liquids. 
And as I said, I expect a translational mechanism. Um, we've measured this dynamics, and the details are that important. Uh, but when we take a, a probe molecule, in this case, um, this molecule, and we excite it and watch the spectra move in time, we see this simple relaxation. There's nothing fancy going on. Um, we map out how the, this is just pretty, but basically we're watching the peak of the spectrum evolve in time and getting this response function. Um, we've looked at quite a few liquids, and so these are some 21, I think, ionic liquids. These are some similar number of dipolar solvents. And in first pass, the dipolar solvents are much faster. On average, the viscosity of a conventional uh, organic solvent is about 100 times less than an ionic liquid. And on average, the solvation times are about 100 times slower than ionic liquids for that reason. Um, there's a lot of scatter. We've, we've tried to understand exactly how to think about solvation in, in ionic liquids. I won't talk about that much. But anyway, so the times are slow. The more interesting thing to me about these dynamics is if you look in detail at how the frequency shifts in time, or equivalently, the solvation energy shifts in time, if you create what we call the spectral response function that characterizes the time dependence going from 1 to 0 as time progresses, um, you see two differences in ionic liquids from conventional liquids. So this is a seed of nitrile, very, very fast dynamics. It's over in a picosecond. Um, in an ionic liquid, you shift over by a couple orders of magnitude in, say, the 1 over E time. Um, in a conventional solvent, well, especially a small molecule solvent like acetonitrile, much of the dynamics has to do with inertial motions. Uh, and there's only a, maybe a 20, 30% residual due to diffusion dynamics. In an ionic liquid, we have some inertial motion going on, but it's in everything we've looked at so far, it's been a relatively small contribution, 20% or so. Um, the longer time dynamics, which has to do with viscous motions of the surroundings, diffusive kinds of dynamics, um, the characteristic feature of the longer time dynamics is that it's very broadly distributed in time. So whereas acetonitrile, you might get uh, relaxation over a couple of decades in time, in one of these liquids, you really get four-ish decades worth of relaxation. You can fit this longer time behavior, the green curve is a fit, to a stretched exponential function. And we characteristically see uh, exponents that are 0.4-ish, a little less than 0.5, meaning a very broadly distributed um, dynamic. So what I want to talk about next is, you know, why, why would one have such a broadly distributed response? And then what effect does this kind of dynamics have on other processes, that is, on chemistry, one might do in an um, Okay, so the origin. There are two different um, kinds of things that might be going on. The first um, is what I'll call glass-like uh, heterogeneity. So people have studied um, well, let me just say, dynamics like this, stretched exponential behavior, is quite common in supercooled liquids and glasses, and many people have studied it for a very long time. And the general consensus is that one gets um, complex dynamics, meaning not simple exponential relaxation, but some uh, distributed kind of dynamics, not from the dynamics of different solutes being complex in themselves, but from there being a heterogeneous distribution of simpler dynamics, perhaps exponential relaxation, that are different in different locations in, in a fluid. And the superposition of these simple dynamics gives you the, the complex dynamics that you observe. We think that's largely why salvation dynamics is this stretch kind of behavior. Um, here's a Here's a useful cartoon from an actual simulation of a 2D system, uh, a Leonard Jones soft sphere, uh, I'm sorry, soft sphere glass, um, just sort of showing that what, what's being shown here is some trajectory over some amount of time, and the little, uh, little squiggles are where a given atom moves in that time. 
you can clearly see there are very well-ordered regions, and then there are disordered regions. So if you put a solute into a disordered region, you might expect it to be fast, into an ordered region, slow. And this is the basic idea of what the glass community calls dynamic heterogeneity. Um, we want to know whether this kind of behavior is what's causing the complex dynamics we see in ionic liquids. And uh, to do that, we use what we call red edge excitation experiment in order to site select um, different, hopefully dynamically different regions in the, in the fluid. So the idea um, is similar to whole burning spectroscopy and other things that you might have heard about. Um, this is the absorption spectrum of a molecule, coumarin, in an ionic liquid. And the basic idea is this absorption spectrum is inhomogeneously oh, broadened. And an analysis of the spectrum based on a line shape that we get um, from nonpolar solvents tells us that this spectrum is a convolution of an underlying structure, the same for all molecules, or close to the same. <coughs> And then some distribution of site-dependent shifts. And the distribution of site-dependent shifts that goes with the spectrum is, is this. So it's, it's relatively broad compared to the overall width of the spectrum. Anyway, we can analyze spectra to pull out what this distribution is. Um, knowing that, what we find is we can analyze, if you excite the spectrum at different places, and if you look at what the fluorescence looks like coming out after you excite in different places, um, if you work in a frozen environment where there's no solvent motion at all, excitation at these different places would give rise to these different emission spectra. And one can see this and reproduce the experimental behavior pretty well in low temperature solvents. Um, so anyway, this purple spectrum, the blue most emission comes from the blue most excitation wavelength, the red most comes from the red most excitation wavelength. There's quite a substantial shift. Um, this is called uh, red edge excitation spectroscopy. Um, you would also see the same behavior if you looked very, very quickly in time and looked at where the spectrum was at time zero. You would also see this um, difference in frequency. Um, then after a short time, the spectrum would relax. But, you could see this at room temperature too if you looked fast enough. Okay, the idea that's important though is um, this sort of shows that by exciting different places, especially on the red edge, you can create different uh, sub-ensembles of the overall site distribution of energies. This black dash curve is um, what the distribution of spectral shifts due to solvation is in the ground state. And these other curves show what you get what you put into the excited state by exciting in different places. So you can take this distribution, and especially on the red edge, you can create a much narrower distribution, and one that's 2,000 wave numbers, um, almost 10 kT, lower in energy on the excited state. So again, red edge excitation puts you way over here on the excited state potential. So the main point is that by exciting in different places, you can access differently solvated chromophores. We can then use that and try to say, okay, um, if I excite different sub-ensembles of the distribution of, of environments, do they relax at different rates? Um, so I can do that looking at solvation dynamics itself. This is a Coumarin experiment. If I excite here, 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 um, on this edge, I'm exciting something that starts out fairly blue it will shift more than if I excite here, because I'm already starting partly solvated. But the question is, if I excite in these different places, are the times for relaxation, the normalized relaxation, different or not? Our experiments are not great at this point, but we believe they are different. Um, and just look at this, look at this curve. We believe that um, if we had enough time resolution to see well, we would see something like a three, I'm sorry, a, a, a two-fold change in the solvation time from the blue edge of the spectrum to the red edge where we can access. So this tells us that solvation is a heterogeneous process. 
starting with different solvation environments, different solvation energies, I get different relaxation rates. So solvation um, is heterogeneous or non-Gaussian. Um, we're looking for these, oh, right, forget it. Um, a little bit easier experiment, or a lot easier experiment, is trying to look at chemical reactions and doing the same trick. So exciting uh, different places along the absorption of a chromophore that's going to react and looking for different kinetics. Okay, so this, this is a, a molecule that isomerizes about a double bond. It has a small barrier to the isomerization. In conventional room temperature solids, this process takes about 30 picoseconds. Um, in an ionic liquid, because the viscosity is a lot higher, it takes several hundred picoseconds. But if we excite at different places uh, on the absorption spectrum, we see significantly different reaction times. Varying from, if we excite at the peak, which is sort of the average of the distribution, um, out to as far as our laser lenses go easily, we get something like a 30% variation. Um, if we go further, presumably we'd see more. So this isomerization, again, displays this heterogeneity. Different environments are giving rise to different rates. Um, here's just another example of a faster reaction. This is essentially barrierless in the excited state. And so in a conventional solvent, the dynamics is about a picosecond. Um, and here again, exciting at these different frequencies along the absorption spectrum, we see a change of about 60% uh, from the peak out to the, to the edge, of, as far as the red edge as we can get to. So the shorter the time in general, we do expect the larger the, the heterogeneity, but the main point is that we do see kinetics that depend on environment. Um, one last example. Uh, those were two isomerizations. Electron transfer in this particular molecule is also heterogeneous. Here, the kinetics is difficult to unravel, but if we just look at steady state spectra, and we excite, this is the absorption spectrum, if we excite this range of, of wavelengths, the relative amount of the initially formed state, so initially you excite locally this part of the molecule, and you get an emission that's here, the LE state. Um, in time, an electron from this uh, dimethylamino, or uh, dimethylamino, or this one, uh, transfers here, and you get a different state, a CT state. The important point is, depending on where you excite, um, you get more or less charge transfer out. The redder you excite, the greater amount of charge transfer fluorescence. Um, these are not equilibrated spectra, and so those differences reflect differences in the rate of the charge transfer reaction depending on where you're excited. Okay, so those are just three examples. We've, um, we've looked at others, but pretty much uh, any reaction that takes place on a um, less than a nanosecond time scale, one expects to see this kind of heterogeneity because solvation and structural relaxation takes a nanosecond or more in these liquids. Okay, the picture I painted here was um, of a fluid that was structurally the same everywhere, but um, different regions because of tacking at time zero or some other effect have different kinetics. There is a different kind of heterogeneity in these liquids that people are quite excited about, um, and that's what I call amphiphilic uh, heterogeneity. Um, this is uh, probably the world's most famous ionic liquid picture. It comes from a simulation of Lopes in uh, quite a few years ago now, where he just simulated a box of imidazolium um, with an eight-membered chain on it, PF6. Um, and what he did was to color code pieces of the molecules into polar pieces, or ionic pieces, and nonpolar pieces, or uncharged uh, pieces, into red and green. And he saw quite a dramatic segregation of these regions of the, the liquid. So this is a, a single component, well, no, it's not a single. This is 
on a large length scale a homogeneous system, but it's one that would like to phase separate if it could. But since this nonpolar part is attached to the polar part, it can't. It does the next best thing and creates regions of nanometer size where the alkane parts in green segregate and the more polar PF6 and midazolium charged parts segregate. So this nanometer scale heterogeneity was also seen um, by both the co-workers in simulation. It took a year or so um, before people saw the experiment, but X-ray scattering experiments, um, this is now looking at a series of liquids like this, anion PF6, cations these, with different chain lengths here from C8, which is this example, C6, C4. If you go to longer chain lengths, what you find is a small angle peak um, whose dimension uh, matches roughly that of the size of the alkane chain. And the effect is a little hard to see. There's still definitely something here, even for a butyl chain. It gets quite pronounced for longer chains. If you go to long enough chains, you get liquid crystalline type um, structures. But, but for C8 and less, um, you don't get anything other than isotropic liquid phase, but you get this structure. Um, and the domain size behaves in a nice, consistent way with, um, with alkane chain. So many, many people, us included, are excited to try to understand um, different aspects of this structure. So if you're interested in solvation, what kind of effects should this domain formation have on uh, solutes? Um, here's again some simulation work by Lopes, uh, looking at, this is now butyl uh, methylimidazolium PF6, color-coded in the same way as the last slide, but now looking at, if I put n-hexane in this, in this ionic liquid versus if I put acetonitrile in this ionic liquid, um, it makes sense, and the simulations show that the hexane likes to live in the alkane regions, and a polar molecule, dipolar molecule like acetonitrile, likes to live sort of in the in-between regions between the polar, um, between the charged groups and the alkane groups. So there's definite uh, partitioning of molecules according to simulation. Um, one of the things that I find puzzling is that where do we see effects of this in the experimental data? Um, one of the things uh, these are just spectra of coumarin, um, but spectra of any other electronic spectra of any other probe molecule we've looked at has not shown anything that says that ionic liquids, these longer ones, are any more heterogeneous than any other system. Um, I would perhaps expect the width of the spectrum of the ionic liquid, that's the dash curve, to be different um, if we're really seeing very different environments in the same liquid. Uh, also, the a lot of the solvation data, it's curious that ionic liquids do dissolve nonpolar things, um, at least benzene-like things, maybe not pure alkanes very well, and also dissolve highly polar things. And people have said, well, that means this domain structure really has an effect, but, you know, acetonitrile doesn't have that structure really, and yet the correlation is, is quite, quite impressive. So, um, I'm almost done. People have been searching in the last year or so for examples of whoops, wrong way, um, of evidence of this partitioning. And I guess the closest evidence that we have so far is uh, Ed Kutemis um, has recently published this work uh, where he's used <coughs> OKE spectroscopy to measure low frequency Raman spectra of CS2, uh, highly nonpolar solute in um, a 5-1 metazolium TF2 anion. And the details I don't want to go into, but um, what he sees is that when CS2 is as dilute as he can make it in the ion liquid, the spectrum that he can extract, these are the overall observed spectra, he's got to subtract out the ion liquid, so it's not a trivial thing to do. But when he gets at the part of the spectrum he thinks is due to CS2, what he finds is in contrast to the black curve, which is neat CS2, he finds that the spectrum 
in this side of the liquid due to the CS2 looks very much like the same spectrum of CS2 in pentane. Um, so he takes that as evidence that CS2 at least, and this is very sensible and I think simulations show that it should, um, CS2 likes to be in the region of the tails of the middle zone group, the C5 tails, and so the environment, according to this molecule, looks a lot like pentane. Now there are, um, so this is one piece of evidence. The last thing I want to mention um, is some, I guess, place for future work and some funny business that may also be related to um, this kind of domain formation. Uh, this is a very complicated slide, but a number of people that we have just started to look at simple bimolecular reactions. So the easiest way to do it for us is to look at fluorescence quenching. We are excited with fluorophore. We have a quencher that comes along, and when they make contact, or when they get close at least, um, the fluorescence is quenched. It's an easy measurement to make. Um, and if uh, the fluorophore and quencher interact strongly enough, if things are right, then the rate of the reaction is, is limited only by how quickly the molecules can get together. So people have measured not a startling number, but some reasonable number of diffusion limited by molecular reactions and other liquids. Um, ignore this. The important point is that in conventional liquids, one can pretty often predict what diffusion limited rates would be by the simple um, Smolachowski um, Einstein prediction. That the diffusion limited rate should just depend on temperature and viscosity in this manner. Now this isn't terribly accurate um, for small solutes, but for large solutes of the sort we're talking about here in conventional liquids, um, I think this is typically accurate to a factor of three or so. Um, in ionic liquids, this is a ratio of observed biomolecular rates to what one gets from this Smolachowski prediction. And one typically sees, these, are, this, these ranges represent different ionic liquids, but one fairly often sees factors of five or 10 faster biomolecular rates than you expect based on this, based on the viscosity of the solution. And in some cases, if you look at um, just steady state spectra and how quickly steady state spectra are quenched by a quencher, you can see some pretty dramatic um, speed-ups compared to what you would expect, 150-fold faster quenching than you expect based on the viscosity. Um, so my conjecture at this point is that um, perhaps one has some enhanced diffusion um, as part of this overall enhancement in rate, but I also um, suspect that partitioning into uh, say the nonpolar regions of the fluid by nonpolar substances sort of reduces the dimensionality of the problem. And there may well be um, some pretty significant association of solutes that we haven't really characterized yet going on that are giving rise to these apparently really large rates when you just look at um, steady state fluorescence. All right, so that probably wasn't very clear, but let me, let me stop there and just summarize what I'm trying to say. Um, ionic liquids are really hot these days, I think for good reasons. Um, from a physical chemist's point of view, there are interesting differences from conventional solvents. Strong ion interactions cause fairly tight packing and ordering of charges. And that gives rise to properties that are at least quantitatively different than conventional solvents. Um, surprisingly though, solvation energies don't appear to be that different than what one sees in simple conventional solvents like acetonitrile. What's really distinctive are dynamics. Solvation dynamics is an order of 100 fold slower in ionic liquids. Um, structural relaxation, I won't talk about that. This slow dynamics then means that processes that one would um, not see any heterogeneity in a conventional liquid processes that take place on a 
picosecond to nanosecond time scale, um, one does observe heterogeneous kinetics. Depending on where you excite, you get different, different dynamics. Um, so this is, I think, something that people have not seen very much of, but I think it's widespread in many liquids if you're working with fast reactions. Um, and the last thing, as I said, sort of um, perhaps too quickly, was um, this nanoscale domain segregation due to the fact that you've got polar and non-polar regions um, is an interesting wrinkle that, wrinkle that we still don't quite understand how it impacts salvation. In some ways, it seems like it doesn't have much effect at all. Um, we're still looking for, for where it does play a role. And then I talked a little bit about diffusion-limited reactions. I think they're interesting things to be understood there. Um, they're unexpectedly fast in many, many cases. And I suspect that it has something to do with this domain structure and with aggregation of, of salt U molecules. All right. But with that, I'll stop and just acknowledge that our work in this area has been funded by the Department of Energy. Um, lots of different people have worked on this. Um, these are just two relatively recent photos of, of my group. I won't single people out except to say that uh, Gary Baker is not a student. He's a, uh, a co-worker at Oak Ridge who's helped us out by supplying a lot of items over the years. I'd like to especially thank him. Anyway. Thank you very much for your Relation does not hold, so that will increase uh, this relation. Yes. So I believe some part of this is due to faster diffusion. We've um, actually <coughs> there haven't been this collection of reactions. To my knowledge, the only um, measurements of actual diffusion constants of the species involved. Uh, Professor Grimora has measured actual diffusion constants of the I2 minus um, reaction. We have measured uh, diffusion constants for these this pair of reactions. And what we find is uh, the diffusion coefficients are larger than predicted by this Stokes-Einstein equation, but by a factor of two or three. So they account for some part of this, but not the dominant part, I don't believe. Uh, and also note the difference I didn't point out. These are uncharged species reacting. Um, charged species reacting, you don't get these very large differences. Um, so. OK, thank you. I thought when I was looking at your slides that the the result that seemed most surprising to me was the fact that the uh, salvation free energies and the electron transfer rates were so unremarkably different when it went to ionic liquids. And I think that at least approximately that means that the reaction fields are similar whether you have the, the small molecule polar liquids and the ionic liquids. 
and I wondered if you had had done any analysis of the, for example, the reaction field, whether the long range components are comparable. I mean, the implication is somehow that the molecule that you're focused on doesn't see the molecularity of the dipole in some sense. And even, and that's very surprising, and I wondered if you thought about analyzing that from a simulation in terms of the uh, contributions of ion pairs that are near and far and, and dipole approximations and things like that. Um, well, we've done some. I guess I can't give you a good answer other than um, I guess that what you're asking for is what percentage of the consolidation comes from what region of the fluid? It just seems to me that it's one way to get at the question of why are these so similar when you wouldn't expect them. Right. Well, I mean, I guess one can say that, you know, in dipolar liquids, dilated continuum models are a pretty good start. Right. And in these systems, you expect the interactions to be longer range, so the details should matter even less. There's one thing I would say, I don't know if you can believe that. Right. But why the two are similar, I think it's a different question. Right, I mean, the, the screening length in some sense is almost zero. Right? Yes. And so it's really the, the structuring that's distinctive about molten salt and higher layer. And so I don't know whether it's obvious that there's longer range than longer layer. Okay. The bear, you know better than me. Well, the bear interactions are longer. I yeah. guess that's all. That's right. um, and it's not the case that things far out don't matter. I mean, the, the net response does include quite a bit farther out. Um, anyway, I think yeah, I should, should look more at that. So it's time to proceed. Yes. So I'm